everyone, this is update for July 6, 2023, day 498 of the war and of the date update, also catch up for July 5. So I'm gonna, uh, as always, gonna start with uh, strategic topics and then we're gonna switch to and go to discuss situation in Ukraine. So as you can see, uh, uh, I'm gonna provide the update on, this, on the situation in the US banking system. Uh, as I said before, uh, situation sort of in remission, and you can see that uh, <laughs> the stress is slowly uh, subsiding in the U.S. banking system. Uh, it does, and that I'm not trying to say, say that this is resolved. The problem is resolved. It's not. Um, and also, as you can see, interest rate uh, remains uh, pretty high as well. Uh, so it's, as I said, in remission. Uh, how long it's going to be remission remains to be seen. Um, uh, as long as interest rates are going to remain high and go higher, uh, things will not get back to normal and uh, may get uh, very easily out of control. Uh, just uh, basically totally. Uh, at, well, at this point, it's unpredictable. Uh, now let's switch to the marker situation. And actually, this is related to interest rates. Uh, so first, I want to um, discuss a little bit this manufacturing since we, uh, you know, I talk about it a lot uh, recently. Uh, so there were new orders in manufacturing for May in Germany came out. So as you can see, manufacturing overall down 4.3 on uh, on year. So basically May this year versus May of 2022. Uh, however, on the months, so April versus uh, May, uh, it went up by 6.4%. Uh, one of the, actually, it's, in, I don't have sort of 100% confirmation for it, but the biggest reason for this positive result is actually uh, apparently military uh, military uh, manufacturing. So uh, this, to what extent, um, you know, if it's like driven, like let's say 80, 90, 50 60 percent i don't know uh but it's but it's definitely part of it is uh pickup in um, military manufacturing uh, in germany uh, then uh, let's switch actually to us where there was a lot of um let's say interesting data so uh the most important is uh the job situation in the us so as you can see uh, first of all, there is gain in employment, huge gain uh, in the U.S. Uh, also, the sort of forward-looking situation with employment, uh, job cuts is going down from almost 300% jump to only 25% jump. So it's clearly uh, the job market in the U.S. remains very strong, and also if you look continuous jobless claims also remains actually going down. Uh, so. Uh, this is definitely labor is uh, in a strong position in the U.S. And what this really means is that um, probably inflation will continue. Uh, and mm, so we will, s and there is another sort of point to this is that uh, the interest rates will go up uh, because of that. And uh, what will happen uh, most likely, and this is always in, nobody knows for sure, but it could be very counterintuitive uh, situation where rising interest rate actually will start contributing to inflation itself, uh, because you increasing cost of capital, your labor is also going high, and so that contributes to a very uh, persistent um, inflation. And this is not just U.S. phenomenon. This is in general, in the world, in the West, in particular, and um, the problem with the labor is demographics, right? It's um, it's shrinking labor pool, basically. Uh, in and this is not just U.S. Actually, U.S. is relative in relative better situation. It's in bad, but relatively better. Let's say relative to Germany, let's say, or relative to South Korea, relative to Japan. Um, it's in better position, but still in bad position. And so that will put, put pressure, um, inflationary pressure, basically, uh, in the U.S. And also, as I said, all of this um, uh, 
policy, misguided economic policy with respect to uh, energy, they also uh, increase um, inflation. They all uh, contribute to increasing in inflation. It was, you know, every step towards in, in direction of those policies, sort of deeper implementation of those, they uh, decrease standard of living, contribute to inflation, reduce productivity. And so you see this uh, strong, like basically at this point, three main strong forces is a demographics, then capital. And the reason for capital actually is because it was wasted over, you know, prior 14, 15 years, a lot of capital was wasted. So there's a shortage of capital. Uh, this may not be sort of fully realized and understood, but it's sh there's shortage of capital in the world because the world was essentially um, 14 years was, if you talk into in agricultural term, it's essentially uh, the world was eating the 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 seed uh, grain that you're supposed to uh, you know to plant in uh, in the spring or or in the fall. So that's something that you're supposed to actually you know not touch and use for future uh, generation of future grain. So and this is what's been going on over this collectively you know, the the whole planet was you know, i guess you can say doing this madness collectively and so this is uh this is another factor uh and then uh completely uh, wrong um policies in the west in general this is not just us europe probably even i would say war like in particular germany is even worse in this respect this also contributes strong, strongly to inflation, uh, to basically decline in the living standards. So this, I would say, three major forces, they will really drive um, probably stagflation or situation in the West and, and in the world as well, uh, because it's all one uh, ecosystem. It's just, there's no, it's, it's just one planet, really. Um, so... Uh, but uh, again, so this situation was uh, you, uh, was labor in U.S. is kind of confirms that uh, labor will remain strong, or definitely it will get weaker as interest rates going to go up. You know, the strengths will go down because eventually, sort of gravity uh, will pull labor situation to the bottom. Uh, but for now, it still remains strong, and definitely strengths is. Uh, eventually it will go down as I said and then also very interesting number on the new manufacturing orders in the US in May uh, this is a non-adjusted numbers and I always prefer to look at non-adjusted numbers because that's a raw numbers and not massaged by various people because they have their own incentives so as you can see in May of 2023 the value uh, that produced was 588 billion and in May of 2022 it was 589 million so again this goes back to what I said before there is no manufacturing renaissance in the US if anything it's actually declining slightly it's tiny but probably also statistical sort of uh, error but there's clearly no growth and the same as there is no growth essentially anywhere in manufacturing uh, these days uh, then uh, another data point that came out was retail sales uh, in the European Union. So as you can see, it's negative 2.9 year on year. So that's really uh, tells a lot about the consumer. It's in uh, probably terrible bad shape, which is not surprise because of the declining uh, living standard uh, in the West and, and I would say everywhere, but uh, in the West in particular, since we're talking about that. Uh, then also Japan is the same story as you can see household spending, uh, you know, negative 4%. Uh, we can say that the, the trend is sort of slowing down before it was negative 4.4. So it's not uh, going down as fast. Um, so the accelerate, definitely there's no acceleration in this. Uh, but overall, as you can see, the situation is, uh, is clearly like not a rosy picture. Uh, with the exception, the only sort of positive side is that there is a lot of still people uh, employed, continue, employed and continue their employment uh, just because there is a shrinking number of uh, people and 
in a way productivity goes down if productivity goes down you need uh, more hands so that's another um, sort of result of it but as a result you also every hand earns less right so that's sort of in nutshell what's going on there now let's talk a little bit about China this I just came across this interesting map and this is a Chinese projects uh, in uh, Africa specifically this is railroads the so red ones are Chinese railroads and I think yellow if I'm probably I don't remember exactly maybe Korean gray one is Indian but essentially what this really shows is uh, China really built strong economic uh, influence in Africa essentially I almost want to say it controls more or less Africa I mean Africa is not really controllable uh, in a true meaning but to extent you can uh, you know, exert influence China definitely has a lot of influence there and this is what actually China did with that uh, money that it earned from uh, US and from Europe they did not recycle it into the debt um, obligations of their US or European governments they actually spend it on building this infrastructure and building influence and building opportunity to extract resources from Africa so this is just so this is just interesting how literally ev like almost everywhere right except for Sahara obviously and really South Africa but uh, the rest they really control quite a bit uh, the rest of the Africa so in other words this is I think what's that this is kind of like the this bottom of the iceberg that's under the water that's not really how to say understood and and visible to the most the, to what level to what degree uh china is has you know built influence in africa basically um this is another there is another important uh, news from uh, china uh, Chinese president went and ex inspected uh, what are they called um, Eastern Military Command uh, in China that's obviously the most important one um, and that's the one that's sort of expected to invade Taiwan so uh, prior to that I think a couple months ago he went and visited uh, Southern Military Command which is going to be sort of on the flank covering the flank of the Eastern one when the Eastern one will invade um, uh, Taiwan so again this is not uh, as you can see this is this is down to kind of like build connections to the military to show that they are important uh, and you know obviously as you can imagine this is this is not done when you prepare for peace basically uh, so this is another data point in in the direction we already know where it's all going um, now let's switch to Ukraine um, as a whole, I just want to give heads up. Um, it's strategic dead end for Ukraine right now, the way it is, right? And it's strategic dead end for Russia for now as well. But uh, if this continues as war of attrition, there's no brainer that Russia will win eventually, just because Ukraine will run out of people essentially that's very straightforward there is no you know no it's not a rocket science in the way it goes right now it's exchanged roughly one for one plus minus could be 1.1 1.2 versus one but it's for their from the big picture perspective the exact number it doesn't matter what matters is that it's roughly the same and because Russia is four times larger this obviously uh, gives a very clear answer where it's all going and again the problem is that Ukraine was never able so far to turn into quality because in qu quantity is you know obviously cannot win so the only pa pass forward for Ukraine is quality um, and as I said there are no changes in that respect um, and, and the all changes are sort of because the current political military leadership simply will not be able to do it it's just not in their dna um, there is i don't even discuss about uh, you know never-ending uh, corruption scandals in ukraine at this point because 
it's sort of hopeless. It's just not that I accept it, but it just you know it's it's talking you know it's it's essentially tilting against the windmills and that's really what's there um and so again because of that um the soldiers are not prepared um and there's it's poorly com poor command poor organization so everything is is disorganized or say dysfunctional in all aspects everywhere where you tr you look and also there's another uh, problem that's um, in its early stages where uh, the new sort of what's newly mobilized sol soldiers in Ukraine the, the quality is clearly declining like motivation wise like it's very clearly on decline and it's gonna get only worse because initially you obviously you know you pull everyone who really wants to you know defend ukraine and so on now many of those people you know dead or wounded and so on there are still obviously there is still skeleton remains but <clears throat> but this is very um dangerous trend um you know i don't know when it will sort of turn into sort of uh, real problematic situation but that trend is uh, there and it's as I said it's gonna get only worse and again uh, this could be changed uh, but uh, you know with more training you know proper changes in the country to create incentives uh, for, for those people who don't see incentives at this moment um, so they are motivated but it's just not gonna happen with um, Ukrainian current Ukrainian leadership let's put this way um, now let's uh, walk through the uh, front line as I always do in a clockwise fashion so gonna start in, uh, in the north the situation along the state border is more or less the same some you know regular exchange of artillery or sort of you know, rocket fire all of that UAV attacks but sort of within the normal range uh, no, I'd say signs of any kind of like non-usual activity. Let's put this way. Um, then let's jump to the uh, North Luhansk front line. Things here as well the same. Nothing really changes. Some tactical attacks uh, by Russian forces. Uh, you know, there is a lot of fighting going on in this <clears throat> for, to control this uh, forest. So, but it's all, it's not offensive. It's not Ukrainian offensive. Uh, it's not any ma Russian major attacks. It's just sort of tactical fights. Uh, now let's jump to uh, North and Bas front line. Uh, things here are more or less the same. Again, uh, Russian attacks out of this uh, salient that they developed. And then let's just actually jump here. And then Ukrainian attacks straight north and south of Bakhmut and a little bit um, even more south. Uh, there was uh, actually a difficult situation the Ukrainian side created for uh, Russian troops in defending Klishivka. They Basically Ukrainian troops were uh, on the outskirts of Klishivka but uh, Russian side managed to, uh, to sort of hold the line last second uh, but uh, it, looks, it looks that eventually Mm, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian side will be able to sort of slowly uh, with a lot of pain and a lot of losses but sort of make some advances here uh, this is nothing sort of it's not a breakthrough again it's not offensive it's just you know tactical victory and you know that's that's all it is that this doesn't change the course of the war doesn't even change the situation around Bakhmut Bakhmut is still uh, for now, uh, firmly in Russian hands, and there is not even uh, light at the end of the tunnel that uh, that Ukrainian uh, forces will be able to retake Bakhmut anytime soon at this point. But they do try. And now let's uh, jump to the uh, central Donbass front line. Uh, since here, as, as uh, I'm, a, I'm a broken sort of ra record again. The same attacks, Pisky salient or similar, I guess sometimes out of this salient, uh, then Marinka attack and this no Mikhailovka area. So all without success by Russian side, but they, as as a clock, they continue attacking there. 
Uh, now let's move to the Parisia front line. So here, um, what's happening? There's this sort of, and it's kind of like you cannot even call it offensive, but um, the Ukrainian side is tactically continuing continuing attacks in the same area. This is Pietrhatki area here, and this is. Uh, this Velika Novosilka salient, which essentially at this point is gone. Um, but, and then, you know, Ukrainian side is trying to kind of continue force, squeeze uh, Russian side out in a painful squeeze. That's, you know, it's not going to lead to anything. Again, this is, not, this is, you can't call it offensive. This is just a tactical squeeze. You know, I would say... Um, uh, in a big picture, or from a big picture perspective, this is actually um, neg net negative for Ukrainian side because the amount of resources that's being spent does not correspond to the gains or opportunities to, uh, created from this gains. Again, this is going back to that the, to that what I said before. This is strategic dead end for Ukraine. So the only way is. It's either improve quality of the organization, motivation, and everything in Ukrainian army, or uh, get more, you know, more technological equipment, weapons, right? In other words, um, and this might be happening. I think there is uh, announcement that uh, cluster uh, ammunition was uh, bombs were uh, approved by the U.S. for Ukraine. Uh, definitely, um, you know very nasty sort of surprise for the Russian side. There's no question about it. I am not sure that this is going to be uh, truly what's sort of changed the situation uh, in Ukraine for, for in Ukrainian favor in a strong way. Uh, it definitely helps, uh, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm very skeptical that it's going to be sort of game changer uh, in terms of uh, weapons. Um, definitely, probably will reduce um, the death toll on Ukrainian side and it will it will help with offensive because uh, they are very useful in clearing up trenches and so on. Uh, but we'll see if that really happens and uh, there's also uh, concerns in, in, in terms of um, that uh, this type of weapons think they are prohibited in the most of the world but legally um, you know, Ukraine, Russia, and the U.S. never signed to that agreement, so they legally not breaking anything. But um, but that just uh, kind of the situation there. Uh, now let's uh, jump to the last section of the front line. Uh, this Kherson or Dnipro, uh, Russian side continuing its continuous uh, its. Uh, attacks in attempt, attempting to destroy this bridgehead here without success uh, and you know the same idea wasting resources similar to what Ukraine does uh, without achieving anything so in this case it's a net negative for the Russian side uh, net positive for Ukrainian side uh, and again going sort of kind of like thinking about this reflecting all of this uh, it's truly kind of situation in like 1916 World War One, uh, in terms of um, you know the the defense is so strong that um, you know you need technical advan advances or organizational advances uh, to really uh, start moving forward for for, for both sides. Uh, otherwise, it's just mid grinder um, and you know. Uh, it may resolve uh, in what I said before, 1917 moments uh, for both countries, and they both firmly on that path uh, at this point. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks uh, for watching. Until next time, bye bye.